I just love the sound of it. It just sounds great. And then I use um, exclusively use Unity Audio Boulders for mixing. The original ones, not the Mark IIs, the first ones that I think are just terrific. Um, and then I bought basically the left loads side. Loads of toys. Loads of, loads of nice toys, <laughs> yeah. Um, the le I try. It's, I sort of divide it into what I imagine is the left brain and the, the right oh, brain. Of course, Do you remember I told yes. you this? Yeah, yeah, you were telling me this. So, yeah, so yeah. as I understand it, the left brain is the calculative kind of problem solving side mm. of, your, of your brain and the right hand side is the creative. So all the recording equipment, the Pro Tools and the machine room and the, the preamps and the compressors and anything that captures the sound, manipulates it, lives on the left. And then anything that creates the sound, so my synths, yep. guitar amps, pedals, instruments would generally be homed on the right hand side. Um, and it's just a nice way of, it just probably doesn't mean anything in the workflow, but in my mm. mind, psychologically, it's a nice way of just separating those two worlds a little bit. And this is a sort of throwback to some of the kind of <laughs> the electronic vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice to see hardware mm. synths and That's generally the rapid things I don't know how to use. So the time code stuff and the, the, in my world, it's just never something yeah. at all I've, I've needed, but obviously. I'm you, impressed with the 19 inch wide. Yes, this is, That's this is perfect. Brilliant. Well, listen, there's a story behind <laughs> that. So I bought that off my cousin when I think I was 12 or 13, when I was just starting to get into guitar music. And, um, and I listened to it. But since I've had that well, since I was 12 or 13. So what's that now? Uh, Three seven, years, seven, four uh, years. 17 odd years. <laughs> and I've listened to every record that I've ever yeah. really, you know, really got enjoyed mm. as being through that thing. So it's, it's so easy right. to get overwhelmed by yes. monitors and, and not necessarily even smaller ones. They can just overwhelm you with detail sometimes that you don't really understand where you are again. Is this like a standard mixing setup? Yeah, usually the first, the first 16 faders are pretty much mm. always the same. So there'll be a stereo snare sample, which is usually the ambient sound of things. Right. So it's not really necessarily a, a snare sound as much yeah. as it is a snare ambient right. sound. And do you make them? Yeah, a um, bit of both. I've got, I mean, I've got thousands of them. Yeah. Um, some of, I wouldn't necessarily say I make them from the drum kit I'm recording because right, I usually okay. get plenty of that on the mics I've recorded yeah. sometimes. Um, Just want something different. More often than not, this is so that I can manipulate the ambience and not manipulate the, yeah. the core drum sound. So if I want to have the snare have way more perceived bottom end without actually making a snare that's got lots of bottom end, then I'll either find a sample or manipulate whatever this sample is to have to be really weighty and heavy. And is that one sample that you, you use or is it some kind it's, of deep sample? I've got, it's, I mean, am I allowed to name drop? It's, I've got lots of slate ones that I don't really favor the slate samples as the core sound, but yeah. his ambient samples I think yeah. are really good. The SS, yeah, yeah. SSSR and NG and, and NRG studio yeah. I think is, sam yeah, yeah. is sampled. Um, and there's a company called That Sound as well that I use a lot that Again, they're, they're close because the samples are great, but I just don't need them. It's the, it's the room yeah, sounds that they capture sounds. are really good. And obviously, because the stone room is so got so much character to it, sometimes you just need a little bit more than what the stone room has, mm. something a little bit different. different. Yeah, yeah, but to, to enhance. So this is mostly EQ to or processed to be really bottom heavy right. so that you almost get that big 80s, that sort of... Um, yeah, the, the, the record I'm thinking of is the, the Peter Gabriel So record where some of his snares are almost like kick drums yeah. that, that I yeah. fell in love with, and that's what this would sound like. And then when you send that to the reverbs, it moves air rather than moves rather than cracks. Yeah. And then yeah. So you get the crack from your close mic um, or from whatever else. And then pretty much the same process with a kick sample, but that's a mono right. kick sample. Um, and then kick snare hats, pair of toms, yeah. pair of overheads, pair of rooms, mm -hmm. and then... If I'm using multiple room mics, I'll just get a blender like and they get summed, mm -hmm. and that's just the room imaging. Yeah. The bass comes out on two faders. This is something I stole from Michael Brower, so I've got the <laughs> neck and the body, so the top and bottom end. What I realized, actually, when I was thinking about this video, is kind of thinking, are there any patterns that I definitely do without realizing? And what has occurred to me is I'm really into this using top and bottom processing. So like a back sandal EQ, so I'll record with a bright and a dark mic on most things, on mm. guitar amps, bass amps, a lot, most of the drum kit. When I process things, it'll usually be the top and the bottom, and the mid range is where you, the mid range is the difference in the blend between those yeah, two. Sure. It's, it's like using an old, like a Pultec, you have, you can boost bass and you can boost treble, mm. and wherever you do those things, the, the combination of that and how the mid range interacts sure. is the sound. So that's kind of a, a recurring pattern, I think. Um, so doing this is really nice because you can really hype the bottom end here on on the bass track on the bass body and not compromise the top end sound of it different compressor on this one that is more sympathetic to the bottom end different compressor on the neck or the sort of mid-range and top that's more sympathetic to that that i can dial in some growl if i want and you just it's much much, much more quick to blend them it's than it is to eq them a mastering mentality yeah, isn't it exactly. to split that spectrum yeah, up yeah and um, yeah yeah cool and then and then guitars and yeah everything so usually these 
these next eight faders would usually be, sorry, 10 faders would usually be instruments of whatever description, right. so guitars and whatnot. Yeah. And then usually the vocals would get parked down here. Ah, uh, um, right, okay. But what I did recently is I, I, I was just bringing things, this was a quite a complex mix session, mm. so I was just bringing things out in pairs. So one guy's guitars got all the pair, oh, got a pair for himself, and sure. I kind of captured what I wanted in, the, in Pro Tools, so there wasn't really much to do, it was just volume and kind of moving it. Um, so and again, there was so many layers of vocals. It just made more sense to bring them out on a pair, and then just do things with hardware inserts. And um, th this is definitely getting smaller. I'm using less of that side, yeah. but I'm making the same result. I get the same results. That really, I don't know. I don't know why that is. Streamlining. Efficiency, streamlining. Yeah, um, but I mean, for the sake of two faders, I could move those over there and have something else there. Mm. I'm not going to get a, a vast benefit in extra summer because it's two more faders. It's not really going to do a whole lot. I'm not EQing this because because I'm not doing it here. I'm doing it in other places, so there's not a great need to have more console real estate. It, sure. it, it fits in its fine. And then you print stems as well. Yeah, as print a stems. Yeah. So um, for label. Yeah. So you, usually what happens is do the mix, um, get, get the mix to where I feel it sounds cool in the analog world. Not to say it couldn't go further, but if I start to do anything more now, I might start eroding what yeah. feels great about it. So then I print stems, which are pre-compression and pre-any pre, pre -any mix bus processing. And then what could be anywhere between a, you know, like a 40 to 100 and something channel uh, mix multi-track gets down to about 12 stereo stems, 12 or 14, 15. Um, and then I'm working in the box then on it, but I run the mix bus processing on hardware inserts. Sure. So I've got a compressor up in the rack there in the machine yeah. room, which is the, the Allen Smart C2, which is just an SSL type compressor with um, the knobs are set and they're taped over so you can't move them and they haven't been moved for about three years and that's basically my, the, the sweet spot for me for the SSL compressor and that lives on a live mix bus in, uh, hardware insert in Pro Tools so when I the console feeds a track in Pro Tools that has that inserted on it mm. when I come to print stems I print to new stereo tracks deactivate the original multi-track and those new stereo tracks get rooted through that again so I'm always hearing that live effectively uh, until and, the end. and you can drive that harder yeah, or just with a VCA so, so, so rather than a threshold yeah I've set it so nominally I get enough enough headroom on it that I can print really hot and not clip or mm. I can print low enough and get sure. enough gain sure. and you just VCA it in and out and awesome. ride it can I just say sorry um, yeah. Russ Russell one of our other guys he does something very similar because he has his, his studio sometimes he has to work from home so yeah. he started getting into this thing of actually Printing his mixes at the studio yeah. as stems, yeah. and then he'll go home and do the refinement yeah, yeah. with a bit of distance. And yeah. It's quite an interesting. That's exactly what I do. Very cool. That's exactly what it is because I, I mean I I just I, I can get a mix I, well I, I can fluke a mix to be 100% right in yeah. one session, but more often than not I'll go I think it feels great. Yeah. I'll take it home and I'll go it still feels great, but I'd like to just do this. I'd like to just do that and just do that. And I, I genuinely can't do it. I haven't got the attention span mm. or the confidence to do it in one hit. Mm. I, need, I need at least a sleep on it. So the security of being able to do it in a STEM session in the box is is the, is the magic, really. Mm. I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't, for economics, I couldn't leave the console right. forever and ever and ever until revisions come in. Um, and also, I mean, it's, it's so, I actually think for my my psychology of it, not having so much to play with is better for me because I'll fiddle and I'll, I'll, I'll erode a great mix. So reducing a big session onto the console is the first step in that. Then reducing the console into a smaller session again to what might be a third of the amount of channels is another magic step in making sure that I'm constantly moving forward towards a good mix, not moving sideways yeah. around it. Someone yeah. said to me once, there's no such thing as total recall, even on digital yeah, audio yeah. workstations, because you'll turn it on. Yeah, exactly, and you'll do it. exactly. It never sounds like <laughs> how you left it. Down the line. And, and, you know, people say about how the recall, it never recalls the way that you left it. I think actually your ears don't recall it the way that they yeah. left it. Quite often I've gone home and I've, you know, gone home at 8, 8, 8 p.m., gone, the mix is great. The mix is really good. I've got to tweak something, but the mix is great. Come back to the next day and go, the mix is great, but it doesn't sound like how it sounded mm. to me yesterday. And, I, and nothing has changed. It's digitally stored, mm. so it can't change. It's just your ears and your perception are, are different. Um, but it's, you know, it works. I, I like it. I'm very comfortable with it. Um, I do like mixing on consoles. I've tried, tried in the box. I've tried hybrid. I've tried all sorts of different funny ways. And sonically, they're all fine. But in terms of what suits my, what, what, what is sympathetic to my foibles and definitely helps my strengths is a console that mm. I can just reach and do things and move it. And I, I feel comfortable here. There's no this visual distraction, the meters are all turned off, you know, the screens are black, it's just good, it just works.
I think. Awesome. My console guys. And it's a cool, <laughs> it's a cool creative space. Yeah. And yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us. No, you've it's been well, thank awesome. You, thank, you, thank you for coming. Awesome. Uh, we should go and uh, play with some instruments and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, from, from the Bring Me Horizon thing, they're obviously yeah. in, they're quite an established band. Mm. Did you get a sense of what this brought to them from overhearing or what they directly told you um, as, a, as a difference? Because I can imagine how they probably worked in the past. Probably quite different to this. I mean, they, but. so um, I think they just wanted somewhere really comfortable. So I didn't actually do the whole record in here. We, we met, we did the, the first single in here. The way that we met was that um, they came through the Maloko group who represent the studio, represent me to a degree. And um, they obviously their label and, and, and uh, A&R coordinators were talking and, and looking for a studio in the north because the band didn't want to have to come to the south and, and work there. They also didn't want a studio that was too remote because all their records in the past have been done in these remote studios. I mean, great ones, Angelic was the last one. And that's a fantastic studio, but for them, they just wanted to be a bit more connected to, you know, they want to be able to drive home and these kind of things. So we did the single and it came off, it worked out it really, really well. It exceeded the expectations that we all had. The idea was to get at least some daytime radio play and it ended up getting a list, you know, repetitive throughout the day. So everybody was really chuffed. Then when they chose a studio to do the album in, as much as I was gunning for them to do it in here because I was more comfortable here, they were like, no, well, we've got some budget. We would like to, we'd like to spend it, you know, otherwise it's going to, no one's, no one else will spend it. So we Googled most fantastic recording studio on the planet and Blackrock in Santorini <laughs> came up. <laughs> so I got the email to say the band would like you to go to Blackrock with them for two months and make the record. And uh, I Googled Blackrock, oh, Santorini, okay, you know, yes, great. Um, and I think for them, I mean, the lifestyle there was amazing. You know, it, it was like, it was like a film studio. You know, it's like, it's like Hollywood, you go. And, um, and they just wanted to not be, they just don't want, didn't want to feel the burden of making the record. They wanted to make the record comfortably. Um, and any burden would be the creative effort they put in, not the lifestyle burden <coughs> on them. And it was great for me because it was hot. And, you know, the <laughs> per, they brought a personal trainer with them and all sorts. Did you take the same trans sensibilities of like, yeah. right, we're going to set up these, yeah. this is how yeah. we'll do it. Yeah. It will always be available yeah. to record that yeah. there any time. Precisely, yeah. exactly. I, I took a lot of my own gear. Yeah. Um, the, the studio was quite cool because it had the control room on one side and then in the middle it had the big live room and then on the far side it had another, well, what was a booth and a smaller booth behind it and we set up two studios. So I had the big control room and the main live room and the small guitar booth and then this booth, which was probably about half the size of this room, became the vocal booth with a, another a control room behind it or you know, a, a studio behind it so that they could be working on vocals and arrangement and writing in there whilst I was tracking the band and building the production. So we actually finished about two weeks ahead of schedule Brilliant. because we were just flying, 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 flying. Um, and this, I mean, the album was rewritten and rewritten through that process and refined a lot, but the same sense of trying to remove as much of the technical yeah. limit, the technical kind of guff as possible, you know, the, the drudgery, and just mean that you walk in with your coffee in the morning at 9 a.m. and you just turn it on and you're there, the amp yeah. is playing, you know, the drums are playing, everything is just done. And, and I think as well, because we were refining the record and rewriting it a lot. There were sessions, also there were time, songs where we redid the drums or dropped in on drum parts on week five of week 10. Well, so if the drum sound changed yeah. drastically, then you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna notice. So it was important to make sure that we got it right on the first week, we got, a we got the best sounds we could get and then say, okay, they are the sounds defined for the record. And we really documented any changes that I made it had to be documented and the assistants kept these really good notes. And then when it was okay, we're gonna go back and recut a song on the, recut the drums on the first song or we need to drop in a drum fill which was, that, that was happening. Then you, you spend 10 minutes recalling everything. We were measuring things, we had diagrams, go back to how it was, cool, put it back. But it's, I, just, I really like that hands-on workshop mm. kind of approach to it, really. Good. And we've just sent Clint Murphy out there to Santorini to get a bit of iPhone footage for us. Going to one of the uh, small booths. So there's a small kind of vocal booth in here. Um, put some cool bass amps or whatever, some great gear here. You can actually see into another booth over there, which has an amazing view. So I'm going to just go through there, and I apologise for the the home recording style video, but uh, let's go into this booth here. So this is where the vo most of the vocals get done. And you can see what a killer view that would be doing vocals 
I've heard all sorts of people here. I know Justin Bieber's been in this very room. Go into the, actually the large recording area uh, where the drums record. Yeah, they've got loads of cool gear here actually, nice drum kits. What's really cool about this room is you can see it's got these um, sort of very typical Greek ceilings and um, the reverb in here is awesome. It's really controlled, not too massive. Um, once again, has that uh, amazing view. And uh, there's that bad boy in there. Yeah, so nice chill out area at the back. And you can see it kind of drops down to expose this amazing SSL 9000 J series. It's an 80 channel desk. Um, Costas, the studio owner and manager, has um, a lo loads of different speakers. So um, if you're traveling to Santorini, you don't have to try and get some in. This is probably one of the reasons why I love the studio as well. They also have a TG1, uh, which actually cost the sport after I bought mine here last time. Yeah, so some nice ADL labs, um, tube compressors, uh, cool Eventide Orbital harmonizer there. We're getting some great distortion sounds out of that. But yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, just, it's, it's an incredible studio. It's an amazing place to be and, uh, you know, the Greek are very, very hospitable. Hospi they're good at basically feeding you. <laughs> so there's not a day that goes by where I wouldn't be having maybe a three or four hour lunch or dinner. Um, so yeah, really cool uh, place here. Come visit it. It's well worth it. Clint! <laughs> <laughs> Has that then, that experience, has that changed the way that you approach things here a bit? Has it had an influence? Has it's had it an influence on my career. Right. Huge, like a huge very very strong influence and I'm, very, I'm really grateful I mean they gave yeah. me a, they they kind of they've worked with a-list like big guys before and who've done you know fantastic really culturally relevant records for them so for me to what to work on that was quite humbling I, I was like I mean, actually I'm quite grateful here because I, fully enough the year before that happened I was having a bit of a stale year I wasn't really feeling particularly motivated and not getting that many projects that I was really that enamored with and that really, I could I could hear that in my work. It just wasn't that fantastic. So that came along just at a time when I was kind of a little bit lost and confused. And when that happened, and it's, funnily enough, actually, the same thing happened when the lease came up on the Motor Museum, and I was yeah. five years prior to that. Um, but when that happened, it was kind of like, okay, I can't, I don't want to mess this up. So I've got to make a good thing of this. But because they were established, it meant that all the odds were stacked in our favour for this to be successful. We just had to not make a mess of it. And and the band were really talented. The team, I think, worked really well together. Everybody wanted the same thing and knew, came from the same kind of musical background, knew what was required. So it was just a question of just do a good job and, mm. and don't do something silly and don't make a, a bad decision that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, in terms of ha impacting me work-wise, it's changed my, my approach to recording vocals and right. producing vocals because I do them a lot under control and mm. um, I'm much more... Um, I'm much more involved with the writing and the sort of the, the coaching of the voc vocal performances now, line by line or word by word or, you know, how can I put it? I'm just much more involved in the whole vocal th thing rather than it used to be put mics up, get a great sound and then let them perform. Mm. And that's cool with 1% of singers. who if it, There's 1% of singers I think that I know mm. or that I work with that can pull that off. Most of them, the vocal thing is about, it's like working in the gym. You build up to it, build up to it and you do take and take and take and you you rephrase and you manipulate until you go, wow, that's an amazing comp. And, and okay, now you can go and learn to perform that in one go. It might take you a little while to, to, to program yourself, but we've just created something there that two hours ago didn't exist and wouldn't have existed if we'd have done it without that much hands-on work. So that's changed. Everything else is the same. It's, it's less, it, less is more, I think. Just pinching other people's tricks and less is more. <laughs>